Thank you very much, everybody, for rocking up. <laughs> um, I first heard Katrina talking about uh, indoor meeting places and examining old maps to find out where the entrances were to buildings where these meetings were held. And I thought, here is someone with just a fantastic sense of curiosity. <laughs> And Fola has been following her on Twitter ever since. Uh, she's a voracious reader who shares any number of interesting and bizarre and uh, essential facts. <laughs> um, she's written uh, the Croydon entry for the Alternative Guide to London Boroughs in 2020, um, the pocket tour map of central Croydon for Open City London, and is currently on her third book, uh, which is uh, A History of Contested Public Spaces in England, 1750 to, to 2000. Um, she is reader in history at University of uh, Hertfordshire and the 2020 to 2021 Open Space Society Fellow at the Museum of English Rural Life. And I suppose no other year can have been less about open, but more about, well, open space, sorry, less and more. So over to you, Katrina. Thanks ever so much, Annabelle. Um, hope everyone can hear me clearly. Um, so I'm going to show some slides um, and explain a bit more, but I've been told that the theme for this whole series is looking at the early 20th century, um, particularly the 1920s, 1930s. That's going to be some of my focus today. Um, so I'll share my screen. So, as Annabelle's just introduced, I'm currently the Open Spaces Society Fellow at Museum of English Rural Life in Reading. Um, and part of my fellowship um, is a research project on the Lantern Slides collection. So my talk today will be um, showing you some of the the greatest hits, if you like, from the collection and putting them in a bit of more of a context about open spaces and debates about the rural landscape, planned landscapes, landscape design um, in the 1920s and 1930s in particular, but also more generally countryside preservation um, in the early 20th century. Um, so to introduce it, first of all, um, you can find out more about the collection at the Museum of English Rural Life um, on their website. And you can also view all these images on the new image collection, which is images.oss.org.uk. Um, so they've just finished um, uploading them for free public access. Um, so I do encourage that you look at the whole collection. Um, and what I've been doing really is sorting through them and as I'll show, trying to locate most of them. To give you um, an introduction about the OSS, the Open Spaces Society was founded in 1865 as the Commons Preservation Society, and it is um, Britain's oldest national conservation body. Um, its founders and early members included um, John Stuart Mill, um, Lord Eversley, Sir Robert Hunter and Octavia Hill. Hunter and Hill founded the National Trust in 1895, along with Canon Rawlsley. Um, it expanded its activities, um, first of all, as we'll see from preserving commons um, and open spaces, and then it amalgamated with the National Footpaths Preservation Society in 1899 and became the Commons and Footpaths Preservation Society and eventually became the Open Spaces Society later in the 20th century. So what I've been doing is looking at their collections. Most of their collections are at Merle, um, but there's also a large collection um, of Hunter's um, archives at the Parliamentary Archives as well. There's also some um, collection at the London Metropolitan Archives. So I've been trying to bring those together. 
Um, so you can read my progress on my blog. Um, but what I've mainly been doing is looking at the lantern slides and there's over a thousand of them. Um, and so what I've been doing is collating um, their locations. And you, that was easier said than done in that most of the titles are very vague and there's very little metadata about these slides. Some of them literally just say a field or a pub or um, a park. And it's a process of elimination for a lot of them. But I think I've located probably about 80% now um, and I've mapped them out. And so this is the um, distribution of all the slides. And as you can see, um, the slides are predominantly concentrated in the southeast of England. And that reflects the early activities of the society who were based in London and the southeast. And also the main campaigns in the late 19th century, early 20th century were about the expansion of London and the, the swallowing up of the commons in what we now know as the Green Belt. So the majority of the, the lantern slides are of um, the southeast um, and also some in the southwest. There's very um, few in other parts of the um, of the UK. The biggest proportion, thirty percent, depicts Surrey, um, particularly Box Hill and the Surrey Hills, and also the City of London Commons that were purchased or managed as part of the Green Belt from the 1930s. Um, there's very few images of places that we would later see become part of the national parks um, from 1949. So there's, I don't think there were any from the Lake District, um, only a couple from the Peak District. Um, and there's none in, in Scotland or Northern Ireland. Um, so, Here's just a quick summary of what's in the boxes, if you like, the lantern slides. And um, we believe that lantern slides were used um, to illustrate talks um, as part of their campaigns in the 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, um, and to show particularly the successes of the society in conserving many of these particular landscape areas of nat natural beauty and um, parks and commons. So, as I said, there's a lot from the North Downs, particularly Box Hill, Leith Hill. There's a whole box of metropolitan parks and commons. Um, there's a lot to do with ancient forests and trees. So um, there's a whole box of Burnham beaches, mainly of of one beach each. So they're very difficult to locate, but I have been working with one of the conservators at Burn Burnham Beaches um, to see if we can at least work some of those out. Um, there's a whole box on rivers, which again reflected the Open Spaces Society's interest in opening up towpaths and riparian access. Um, it mainly follows the route of the Thames in the um, slides. There's lots of Hampstead Heath, as we'll see. Um, there's a whole box on the Pilgrim's Way, and you might assume that the Open Spaces Society collection would mainly be of landscapes in rural areas, but actually there's quite a lot of street scenes and urban areas um, showing um, ancient monuments, um, Canterbury Cathedral, um, routes along the, the Pilgrim's Way. Another box of ancient forests, about 13% um, of the, the collection is of forests. And then the, the miscellaneous boxes, there's a whole box on obstructions that we'll see which reflect the Open Spaces Society campaign to open up footpaths, remove obstructions on rights of way. Um, there's lots of other kind of generic county landscapes, I've called them, you know, sort of, um, one or two from each county to represent um, the counties of the UK, although not all of them, and stock types of landscape, particularly Castle Coombe in Wiltshire and St Mary's Abbey in East Malling in Kent. So that's what's in the boxes. Um, the majority of the lantern slides show urban commons, um, quite obviously about 14%, um, showing the, the different 
commons that were preserved um, in the late 19th, early 20th century. Then there's quite a lot of the river landscapes too, and a selection of, of others that I've classified. So that's the, the kind of statistical elements of um, the collection. Um, and what I've been trying to do in, in my work, and it's been quite interesting trying to do this over lockdown, um, is locate most of those um, areas. And I'm still looking for leads on some of the images. So if any of you'd like to help with some of the missing locations, um, volunteers are welcome. But actually, as I said, most of the, um, about 30% of the collection is from um, the southeastern Surrey. I live in South London in Croydon, so um, actually many of the images depicted are, are local to me. So I was able to go out in our lockdown restrictions and just go around my local parks and local city commons um, trying to find the exact location. So that's me in the middle of winter looking at Wadden Ponds. Um, that's me on some steps in Wallingham in Surrey, um, trying to recreate the picture of a, a, a smart gentleman um, up, going up the, the rights of way there. And it still um, looks like that. Um, the high fence to the left of the picture separates the rights of way from a naturist camp, which is why it's quite high fence. Um, that's been there since the 1930s. So the rest of my talk is um, picking up on the more historical context of these slides and some of the themes coming through in the 1920s and 1930s um, that hopefully you'll also see in some of the other talks in this series. So um, first of all, parks and commons in the collections. Then the bigger question of what historians have called a rural idyll of the 1920s and 1930s, the myth of the countryside and what that represented about um, key political and social questions that were being raised in that interwar period. Thirdly, the coming of modernity um, and um, new technology and new ways of communication and transport in this era. And fourthly, the, the work of the society in um, trying to fight against obstruction and um, landowners um, destroying rights of way. So parks and commons, um, the origins of the Open Spaces Society are as a commons preservation movement. Um, from 1865 onwards, um, we see the rapid expansion of London and other metropolitan and urban centres into the countryside um, and speculative building is the issue. So we normally associate commons and the, and the idea of saving the commons as um, opposing the process of parliamentary enclosure um, in which um, an act of legislation is passed to basically privatise the rights belonging to a common. But actually in this period from the 1860s onwards, the key issue is suburbanisation, expansion out into um, the surrounding countryside. And so one of the first campaigns is about Hampstead Heath. Hampstead Heath had been a contested space for a long time, but um, it comes to uh, a climax in the 1860s, 1870s, um, with the landowners trying to um, enclose and sell off um, the heath. A Hampstead Heath Protection Fund Committee was founded to try and buy the land. Um, the legal campaign was fought through the courts, um, was only um, won when the, the main landowner um, died. And an Act of Parliament was passed in 1871, which protected 200 acres of the heath as an open space for the people of London. And there's a growing um, awareness in this mid-Victorian period about the value of open space for what they call air and recreation. Um, so this idea that actually open space isn't just about productivity, commons aren't just about agricultural improvement, which was the um, earlier sort of driving force of, of changes to the landscape, but was about 
enjoyment of the the area as a place of leisure. So this shows a a, a fair, a fun fair on Hampstead Heath, and this is in the the Lantern Slide collection. In the 1890s, the London County Council tried to um, basically make ha Hampstead Heath into a park, um, tidy it up, trim out the wild bulls and the hedgerows, turn the footpaths into metal roads. Um, and again, the, the local campaigners um, led by uh, members of the OSS um, passionately um, fought to keep the wild aspects and wilderness and wildness was a quality appreciated um, by the countryside preservation movement. They wanted to um, keep it as a, as, a, as a wild open space. And so Octavia Hill, um, Norman Shaw, Sir John Millay campaigned um, against this. Um, they also campaigned for the extension, the Hampstead Heath extension to the northwest of the Heath, which was created out of farmland, um, largely due to the efforts of Henrietta Barnett. But parkification, the, the Victorian public parks movement was um, a very important element of um, the conservation and preservation of open spaces in the capital and across um, urban areas. Um, and most of these slides, I think, are, are showing um, areas that were conserved or preserved by the Commons and Footpath Preservation Society um, as um, open areas of, of recreation. Um, so this one, Cannon Hill Common, 1928, was taken just after the common was acquired by Merton and Morden Urban District Council in 1927. And various Commons Acts were passed in the early um, 20th century, the 1906 Commons Act, which enabled local councils to compulsory purchase, or at least to um, get a favourable rate on, on land for the specific purpose of um, keeping it as um, preserved for air and recreation. So it's a process of emparkment as well. Lakes and ponds feature very heavily in the box of slides on um, parks and metropolitan parks. So here we've got Battersea Park, which has a different status because it's a royal park. Um, designed by James Pennethorne, opened quite early in the Victorian public parks um, movement, 1858. We've also got a picture of Brockwell Park, um, owned by the LCC, London County Council, opened in 1891, extended in 1901. So I suspect a lot of these um, pictures are taken as part of the campaigns um, to save or, or create um, some of the other um, public parks in and around London. Um, we've got a lovely picture, actually, a evocative picture of Dulwich Park in the snow um, during the First World War. Um, Dulwich Park was opened in 1890, designed by Charles Barry, and then um, redesigned or extended by Colonel Sexby. Um, but there's a process of emparkment. Any landscape design, particularly in the Victorian public parks movement is stretching into the 20th century, is about enclosure. It's about um, designing rational recreation, um, designing the routes that people are meant to take around the park and what you can do and can't do in, it, in, in parks. So whereas in commons, um, prior to the 19th century, essentially commons could be used for many different purposes and were used for many different purposes. The bylaws and regulations that then are laid on commons and parks under council control are very restrictive. And there's a massive debate that I won't go into here in the later 19th century about whether parks could be used for public meetings um, by um, political parties, by campaigners, um, by anyone who wanted to, to express their point of view. And so in the London Metropolitan Archives collection of parks designs, um, the um, parks um, committee of the LCC um, put to the Metropolitan Board of Works um, a um, 
plan of each park and the specific site where people are allowed to hold public meetings or have a rate their political views. So this one's a Southwark Park. Um, so this, these are from the 1930s. Um, so you can see that you restricted, they had, sort of, they've moved it slightly to next to the toilets um, and the ventilation job, perhaps a slightly more unfavorable um, place. Um, Hampstead Heath similarly is quite restricted, even though it's a huge site, um, as to where you can um, have your public meetings. So the, the site had been fairly close to the ponds, as you can see there. So, Parks and commons in this period are very much about regulation. They are about controlling what people can and can't do, um, or at least trying to and policing that as well. And that's where a lot of the conflict over these areas and these areas as, as an idea of public space comes into, because actually there's perhaps even more rules and regulations um, about public parks and commons than there are about other types of open spaces. Um, so there are regulation schemes and bylaws. Um, this is from the Kent and Surrey Commons Preservation Society, which is in the Parliamentary Archives collection. Um, and commons and regulations um, are really important. And Alan Hawkins, the, the late um, rural historian, argued that actually regulation schemes are much more restrictive in excluding people than previous attempts at enclosure had been. For many commons and this um, and regulation is seen from the late 19th century onwards as the best way of, um, of controlling and managing um, these open spaces. So that's parks and commons. Um, I want to move on now to another big theme um, specifically in the 1920s and 30s to do with the open spaces collection and that's the rural idyll um, and this idea of urban intrusion in the um, countryside. So the idea of the rural idyll characterizes much of the literature of the 1920s and 1930s. Um, it's exemplified in perhaps its most famous exponent Clough Williams Ellis um, and his book from 1929, England and the Octopus, which is an interesting read bemoaning the intrusion of urban um, life into the countryside. So um, together with many of the other writers who were looking at the countryside at this period, he moans about bungalows. He hates ribbon development, the spread of, of houses along um, roads into the countryside. He hates petrol stations. We'll come back to petrol stations later. He hates caravans and sharabanks, um, advertising billboards, telegraph and electricity poles and pylons, which create a kind of wire escape um, cluttering up the countryside, litter and fly tipping, and other intrusions of the urban into the rural. So historians like Jeremy Birchart, Paul Redman and David Matlas, among others, have, have really sort of um, characterised this period of the 1920s, 1930s, um, through this language of the rural idyll, the idea that the countryside should be in different from the urban and should be unspoiled, that should have particular characteristics, um, that urban inventions and urban modernity shouldn't intrude into. Um, and this idea was promoted by the countryside preservation movement, by the, the Commons and Footpath Preservation Society and other um, federate and associated bodies like the CPRE, um, the Council for the Preservation of Rural England, um, other societies like the Kyle Society, um, founded by Octavia Hill, um, SCARPA, which is the Association Against Advertising. Again, we'll come back to them. And they identify a desire for ordering, separating the rural from the urban, as well as a paternalistic concern by the middle classes and aristocratic pro proponents of this for 
um, um, natural beauty as a, as a thing to be preserved. Um, we also have the, the concurrent movement for garden cities, which lies in parallel to this and sometimes intersects. So Ebenezer Howard's um, promotion of the idea of, um, again, um, rural beauty, which is integrated with the urban, but still separate from it, um, that we should enjoy the, um, the, the simplicity and beauty of the countryside um, in his model of the Garden City, which is exported um, to America, or Australia with the Garden City movement, also to the colonies, it's an imperial project, and then he's brought back through um, other efforts like um, Hampstead Garden Suburb. Um, again, all these the same sort of people are working within this, this framework. Peter Mandler has argued against this um, dominance of this idea of the rural idyll in the 1920s and 1930s. And he's argued that actually it was more of a minority interest and that actually urban progress and modernity um, was more of a factor civic improvement continued in um, the interwar period. But we do see in the Open Spaces Society collection a continuance of that idea of the, the rural beauty and natural beauty that I do think um, is romantic in its, in its leanings um, and actually stretched beyond the middle and aristocratic classes down to the working classes. This is also the era of the mass trespass and the right to roam movement. And in much of the low level activity that you see, um, particularly in letters to the editor of newspapers and the magazines and, and um, journals of, of these sorts of societies, which are full of complaints about the intrusion of urbanity into the countryside. So let's move on to, oh yeah, that's one of the, um, the campaigns in the journal, the, the Commons Open Spaces and Footpath. Preservation Society. So again, um, this integration of preserving the countryside, in this case, Selsdon Wood, with this rural idyll of preserving it from urbanity, I think, um, meets in a lot of this literature. So some of the um, pictures in the collection reflect that urbanity, Box Hill, there are tons of pictures of Box Hill in this collection, um, probably from all directions. Um, this is just one of them. Um, it's perhaps one of the more familiar landscapes associated with National Trust, in particular, and the Countryside Preservation Campaign in this era. Um, this photograph is probably Edwardian, um, shows ladies and men taking the extensive views eastwards from the slope below what is now Salomon's Memorial and the Viewpoint. Um, and I couldn't quite get the same view. I haven't been up to Box Hill recently, but that's um, the closest one that I could find. So the, the, the ladies are sitting kind of in the middle distance there. Um, Box Hill had already been a popular spot for day trippers with the coming of the railways in the mid 19th century. Though there were few public rights of way, the various owners of the Deep Dean Estates had allowed the public to picnic on the hill. In 1912, rumours arose that the estate was going to sell off Box Hill, partly because they were going into economic difficulty and they did go bankrupt in 1917. This led to a quite a vigorous public campaign to save Box Hill as an open space. Together with the Commons and Footpath Preservation Society, the National Trust entered into negotiations about acquiring the land. City financier Leopold Salomons bought Box Hill and then donated it to the nation. The National Trust took ownership and management of the 235 acres. Um, so I think that's probably that image was taken around that time. And it remains that kind of classic Surrey Hills rural idyll um, today. This is another of my favourites in the collection, Mystery Woman. I would love to know who she 
she was. Again, we've got very little information about um, these um, lantern slides in the collection. Um, she's probably walking along an, a lane near Cookham Rise, near to the River Thames in Berkshire. And again, Cookham is a village that is associated very much with that English rural idyll idea, um, notably depicted in the paintings of local resident Stanley Spencer. A campaign to save Cookham Commons had been long running since 1900. Fundraising campaign began in the 1920s. Um, in 1934, Maidenhead and Cookham's Commons Preservation Committee gave the land to the National Trust. And our um, final image in my categorization of the rural idyll is this one um, of the West Ilsley Downs in Berkshire, um, photographed in the 1890s by Henry Taunt. Um, this type of winding path has been reflected in various iterations, the OSS logo for over the years. Um, the windmill had fallen into disrepair by um, 1907, one in the, the far distance. Paul Nash's 1922 painting, Berkshire Downs, has a similar sort of um, reflection on this winding path through an expansive downland um, landscape. The downs by the, the two villages of East and West Ilsley were used for the sheep corn system of agriculture, where large sheep flocks were fed by day on the grassland and by night were folded into arable land. The fields were later reorganized in the 20th century. The area is still used for racehorse training um, and they're now part of North Wessex AOMB. So move on to another theme that I've picked out of the, the extensive collection of slides, and that's the intrusion of modernity. Um, and this is Patcham near Brighton. So I think you see this if you're going into Brighton on the train, this last patch of, of, of the South Downs um, before you, you enter um, Brighton proper. Um, this is called Patron near Brighton, 1925 hoardings removed. The Countryside Preservation Societies were very concerned about the intrusion of advertising on rural landscapes. And again, representative of this urban intrusion and modernity. So the Society for Checking the Abuses in Public Advertising, or SCARPA, was founded in 1893. It later became the Society for the Prevention of Disfigurement in Town and Country, and its members included William Morris and Rudyard Kipling. Um, and they pressed for legislation, which was passed in 1907 and 1925, which prohibited adverts along roads, railways and waterways in scenic areas, in all villages and on historic buildings, although much of this was unenforceable. Um, these advertising hoardings on the edge of the South Downs at Patcham near Brighton led to the East Sussex County Council taking their owners to court in February 1925 on the eve of the passage of the, the second act, the second legislation. Five companies, including a cinema and a bakery, you can see Giggins Bread on the, the right hand side there, um, were fined for erecting billboards that were up to 170 feet long and nine feet high. The owner of the land was a Thomas Gasson and he was fined five pounds and one pound for every day that his own billboards remained on the, on the down. Another intrusion in the rural landscape was the motor car and also its associations. And it's interesting here, and in, when you look at the language of the countryside preservation movement, actually it's quite pro-motoring as a leisure activity. It saw the motor car as actually enabling um, access to rural sites um, and appreciating the beauty of the landscape and actually describes landscapes that can be seen from the road. So it's not completely anti-motor car, but it is anti the um, impact that the car had on, um, on society um, and landscapes. So um, here we've got 
Ewell in Surrey and a picture of um, the new petrol station there. Early motorists had to buy their petrol in small quantities from shops in a jerry can. Um, the first pavement pumps were installed in 1915, but there were no specialised filling stations until the 1920s. Um, the Roads Beautifying Association was formed by the Minister of Transport in 1928 in response to growing concerns about the impact of motoring on the landscape. This set of petrol pumps in Ewell in Surrey is likely to have been part of the motor services company run by John Swift from 1919. Swift bought a field at the village end of Rygate Road. His motor car business used the former cow shed as his premises and he erected petrol pumps along the side of the field. The area around was being developed as middle-class housing known as Yule Downs. The expansion of suburbia necessitated the construction of a new bypass in 1932. Swift sold part of the field to Surrey County Council for the road winding and his petrol pumps and tanks were moved to a new favourable position along the new bypass. The petrol station is still there off the A24 roundabout. So you've got the um, 1913, I think, six inch OS map and um, the old bypass today along there. And it's, a, I think it's an SO. Um, petrol station. Um, I will say actually that one of the most invaluable tools that I found in trying to locate these sites has been the National Library Scotland map finder, which lets you compare old OS maps with the current maps. So if you want a tool for finding locations, I highly recommend it. Another feature of this period is obviously the impact of war and defence. Military requisitioning of commons and open spaces was not just a feature of wartime. The armed forces and war office continued to use substantial areas of land for training grounds in peacetime. In 1927, the war office planned to acquire three and a half thousand acres of Surrey heathland by compulsory purchase. A public campaign against the scheme was raised by the Lords of the Manor, the common rights owners, former Prime Minister David Lord George and the former War Minister, the Earl of Middleton. The War Office in response arranged a tank demonstration on Tun Tunnel Hill, Mitchett Park on the 12th of November 1927 in an attempt to allay public fears. And the Open Spaces Society had these um, newspaper clips, um, clippings in the, the Lantern Slide collection. Um, taken from the Illustrated London News. So we've got um, these lovely ladies in their fur coats watching on with a ridiculously small sized tank being driven across um, the Surrey Commons. Um, the scheme was abandoned in 1928. The War Office agreed a 10 year license from the Lords of the Manor to use the Commons for a limited number of months per year military exercises but the public were to retain full access to the commons and heath. Surrey Heath remained a key training ground for the armed forces during the Second World War and much of the area at Deepcut and Frimley was acquired by the Ministry of Defence for extensive, extensive rifle ranges and barracks which are still there. Final intrusion of modernity. Um, I've been trying to do a lot of then and now um, comparisons between the lantern slides and, and, and current views. Google Street View, again, is invaluable in that. Um, and this is the village of Hawley in Surrey, um, the pub Seven Bells and the parish church um, in, the, in the background. It's an idyllic looking village scene, um, one of the few landscapes, however, that's whose surroundings have gone undergone massive change. Um, it's St Bartholomew's 14th century church in the background, um, but just south of the, um, the scene is Gatwick Airport. Um, the lantern slide was probably taken around the time that the fields surrounding the Gatwick House estate and racecourse were developed into a private airfield in 1930. Gatwick became a public aerodrome in 1934, with a new terminal building opened in 1936. 
The aerodrome was requisitioned by the RAF during the Second World War. Gatwick House was demolished in 1950 and Gatwick became London's second um, major airport in 1958. So to um, finish off really with um, some of the Open Spaces Society's campaigns, um, obviously they campaign for access, they also campaign um, for opening up of footpaths and the right to roam. Um, it's a bit more complicated, particularly in the sort of relationship with the right to roam movement, but there are some um, lantern slides showing mass trespass and the removal of obstacles and obstructions. This one in particular I'm quite interested in is the demonstration at Sunnydale Reservoir in Bradford, um, which is lesser known. It's not uh, one of the mass trespass um, like the one at Kinder Scout in 1932. Um, but essentially it was a protest um, by the Ramblers and other groups um, in the local area against the closing off of footpaths by Bradford Corporation Waterworks, who were trying to protect the um, water supply. Um, the Waterworks Committee in 1930 complained that picnic parties were leaving litter and cu couples were using the beauty spot for, quote, spooning. Um, the, the West Riding Ramblers opposed this and organised a, a mass trespass of about 300 people up to the reservoir on the 16th of November 1930. Um, the tactic wasn't supported directly by the executive of either the um, Commons Society or the Ramblers Federation, um, but it was a, a local um, protest. What the, oh, and there's roughly whereabouts um, it is, it's still um, a reservoir. What the Open Spaces Society did more commonly was individual um, negotiations with individual landlords. Um, so this image of a man triumphantly standing in a gap in the fence, uh, which had been erected across the right of way at Ken Hill in Snettingsham in Norfolk, shows the conclusion of a case that ended up at the High Court in 1901. Landowner Sir Edward Green had stopped up the right of way in 1885 to stop people accessing his estate, asserting that their customary rights were being denied. Local people took direct action and kept pulling down the barriers. Um, Green and his son sued individuals for trespass, but eventually the, the case ended up at high court in favour of the villagers, and the decision was greeted with a procession led by the parish council. The Commons and Footpaths Preservation Society supported the case and secured a precedent that county councils should contribute towards the expenses of litigation about rights of way. So that's my selection of what I think are the most interesting and representative um, lantern slides in the collection. There are many more, um, but hopefully you've gained a picture now of the sorts of issues that were at stake in the 1920s and 1930s and how we frame them. Um, I'd like to welcome you also to my um, symposium I'm holding as part of this um, project on the 8th of September. It'll be an online symposium on, in the afternoon um, hosted by Merle and we've got a really interesting selection of talks, artist work, photography, poetry, um, and campaigners, um, and a chance to look more in detail at the Lantern Slide collection, help me with locating some of them if you want to do that. So if you want to um, join in, it's free. The booking page is um, up live on the Merle website, or you can email me, um, but thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Katrina. That was absolutely gripping and, of course, beautifully illustrated, which is part of the point of the uh, um, <clears throat> of the lecture. Um, being in the privileged position of running the questions, I usually get the chance to ask the first one or two. So if I may, um, when did the... I mean, Commons and Surrey, as we all know, are very heady stuff. And when did the southeast dominance of the society begin to spread further afield? 
yeah, the, the society has always been um, federated. So there's always been local societies who've been part of what we broadly call the commons preservation movement. And some of those have got their origins way back into um, pre-Victorian era. So in the North, for example, there were footpath preservation societies in Manchester and York in the 1820s. Um, so all of these have a, a longer legacy um, and end up um, federated in some way, either to the Commons and Open Spaces Society or to the CPRE or to some of the other groups. And a lot of the campaigning is shared among them. So the Ramblers also have, um, um, again, activity throughout this, um, the period. Um, so the Southeast element of the Commons um, society in particular, I think, continues and to some extent continues today. I think it's still its major base is still in London, the southeast. Um, but it's all this the activity, the federated societies that eventually end up um, becoming a more formal part of, of either the OSS, or, excuse me, um, or the CPRE. Yeah, quick. Excellent. Thank you very much. And, and also, um, I see there's a comment from Virginia, but if I may exploit my position for a moment longer. When, particularly with the Southern um, commons, were the commoners' rights, did they tend to be extinguished at the time of purchase, or did they sort of um, fall away and were extinguished formally with later commons acts? Yeah, it's, it's mainly... Um... They, they kind of decline in use. So a lot of commons at, um, rights are generally grazing rights, um, you, you know, graze your, your geese on, on the commons and those kind of, um, rather than um, other type like taking um, minerals and taking mm, sure. um, that kind of thing. So those kind of, as we urbanize and suburbanize, those kind of rights become less important for, for as, as suburban life becomes um, less um, subsistence based, if you like. And mm. um, people still rely on woods for firewood and fuel for quite a long time so those are still quite important but they're not extinguished with preservation uh, most commoners retain those it's much more a, a process of of socio-economic change rather than um the regulation schemes usually maintain common rights oh, that's interesting to know because certainly in the commons i've worked on in surrey um particularly um, the First World War was kind of the death knell and um, one suspect it did take time before the, the commoners rights were finally extinguished. So, so Yeah, I've, I've looked at the 1965 lists. Um, so the, the much maligned 1965 Commons Registration Act, um, counties are obliged to kind of collate what common rights still exist and the, the rec records are surprisingly very patchy and difficult so I looked at the Hertfordshire ones and there are a lot of Hertfordshire common rights still existent in, in 1965 but again most of those seem to be um, grazing rights for, for geese and, and a certain number of, of cattle or sheep which I suspect a lot of people just didn't take up as a yeah, right. Yeah, sure. yeah. They're pertinent um, to property, they're, they're associated with a common yeah, cottage. Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, I know Virginia says with regard to the Patcham photograph that the photo of the Downs at Patcham dates from a few years before Brighton Corporation bought the land, partly to safeguard the water supply, but partly to provide recreation for a growing urban area. They ended up with thousands of acres of down and for these purposes all sold off in the last 10 to 15 years. Any more questions? I mean, I could go on talking about commons for hours, but I don't think you want to hear much more from me. Um, you probably will if you don't put another question on there. So there's a threat for you.
Um, the other um, comment I certainly would, because from the point of view of the Surrey Heath, which of course are also often synonymous with common land, the biggest curse now is both building and woodland regeneration and the heathland as a habitat, of course, is is being lost. Um, I don't know how much biodiversity and habitat conservation has come into your um, your studies and your work. Yeah, um, there's quite an interesting narrative there in that um, the way that people saw what the commons and, and open spaces were for changes throughout this period. So in the earlier 19th century, everyone wanted to improve the commons, so make it agriculturally productive. So that's why you enclose um, commons and wasteland, is to drain it and put a load of lime on it and destroy it in that way. By the 1860s onwards, up to the 1920s, 1930s, um, it, the main driver of commons preservation is, a, is recreation leisure use. And there isn't very much um, discussion at all really about um, ecology. It's all about the aesthetic visual landscape. It's about, does this look beautiful? Um, so they're, they're preserving ancient oaks. I think that's why there's so much about um, ancient forests because it's seen as part of the traditional English rural idyll of, of um, ancient landscapes. But that doesn't really change until the 1930s, 1940s. But it's interesting that from um, when we see the establishment of national parks in 1949, um, the Nature Conserv Conservancy Council is separate and ecology and environment is seen as separate from leisure still in, yeah. in, in, in the post-war era. So um, it, it, although, there's a long tradition of naturalists and sort of interest in ecology. That's always seen as amateur. It's seen as something that people take part in as a hobby and not as integral to the design of these places. Certainly when commons are regulated, they're basically turned into parks and you, you stick a, uh, as you can see behind me, this is Wandsworth Common behind me, you know, you stick a metal road through it and you make, you know, you, you regulate the, the where the shrubs are. It's nothing to really to do with ecology. It's more to do with how it looks and how people will use the spaces. Um, another comment from Virginia on the subject of trees, the absence of woodland on the downs in photos of the 1930s compared with now is absolutely remarkable. Um, mm. Certainly, I think that's common throughout. Annabelle says, where would the OSS have given their talks, i.e. who invited them or who, or did they ask to give them in contentious or at-risk areas? Yeah, I, they, they try and talk everywhere, lecture tours, village halls, um, any any sort of support meetings. Obviously, they, they rely on donations, so um, philanthropic type events and they would focus on areas where um, there was a campaign running campaign so you can the lantern magic lanterns are basically the projector of their day so you can imagine them showing here's our successes here's the places we've preserved here are the things that we need to campaign for um, so that's I think they really did promote this idea of what an ideal landscape is through their talks and campaigning um, to, to generally the respectable middle classes who could afford to give them some money um, yeah. and, and sign the petitions to Parliament and through um, sympathetic MPs. Thank you. Um, Matt says, please assist my understanding of a lantern slide. Are they photographs printed onto glass? Yeah, I don't know the technicalities, I'm afraid, but gen yeah, they're, they're like glass slides that you would shine a light through and project onto a, uh, the wall or the screen. Um, Do you know, when the OSS was started, did people understand what common land was? Because today there is this huge problem of uh, people thinking that it belongs to the community when of course it belongs to someone. When did that become an issue? Um, all the way through. 
Mm. Um, I, th I mean, my contentious argument is that I think that the Commons Preservation Society in some ways um, kind of, um, in one way, um, promoted that idea as well, because mm. it became allied with the idea of the right to roam and public access, which is a separate issue from common rights. Mm. Um, so Humphrey Baker, who was very active in the Commons Preservation Society, wrote pamphlet after pamphlet trying to explain what com a common is. Um, actually very useful, very clear descriptions. So many of his pamphlets and newspaper articles do explain what a common is, what a village green is, what the difference is, what common rights are, what waste is. Um, I think it became diluted because the Law of Property Act of 1925 um, allowed public access on metropolitan commons. Yeah. So anywhere that's within a certain distance and under the jurisdiction of a metropolitan borough council um, gains public access. And some of those are obviously in urban areas. And I think that act was passed again with this concern about the, the, the green, what London Greenbelt as it became um, but it, it created issues for other areas which were within jurisdiction but actually quite far from urban areas and I think that elision between the right of public access and this idea of the common as open to all and owned by all um, was was somewhat promoted by the right to roam movement um, and it, it still creates problems because um, people don't really understand the difference. Um, obviously, there's also the issue of village greens are different and have always been yeah. Yeah. as well in terms of access. You've got to be a local resident to have rights of air and recreation on a village green. So there's my favourite legal case in this whole project is from 1795 and it's from Steeple Bumstead in Essex and it's a precedent making case because the um, local lord of the manor sued the neighbouring parish's cricket team for coming and playing cricket on the village green because he said they were trespassing. And what happened? Who won? Um, the lord of the manor won. They, they, got, they, got, they got fined for trespass for playing a cricket game on the, on the village green of the next village. <laughs> Well, that is a very um, interesting insight into the problems of communities and open space, isn't it? Has anybody else got any more questions for Katrina? Um, if not, um, here, here they come. Um, oh, thank you. Yes, Karen says, thank you for a fascinating and thoroughly research talk. And I think that is, I would certainly second that. Annabelle, are you there? Yes. I, can I hand over to you, please, yes, to yes. Um, formally thank uh, Katrina? Yes. I think when um, Helen introduced me at the very beginning, she asked me to um, introduce the whole series, and <laughs> I'm afraid I, I failed completely to do that, and probably because I knew it was relevant, but I didn't quite know how. And I think what you've done, Katrina, is to sort of, although you haven't, mentioned the Landscape Institute or the Institute of Landscape Architects, it is there and I think there's roots. I think we can see that, can't we? There are roots from all the things that you said into what made that agitated little group quite fiery and feisty. So I'm um, sorry, I didn't expect you to mention it because you said that you weren't going to and you hadn't looked at that. <laughs> so sorry, that's an aside. Thank you. Fantastic. I, I'm going to have to watch the replay to take it all in because I think there was so much content there um, and so many different angles and, and all those boxes that you've looked through. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Thank you so much.